Welcome West Michigan. My name is Pamela Kime from Grand Tap Media and this is Breathing the Corporate Grand Show. This is season two and I have a very special guest for you. The spirit of the show for season two is that we're going to bring you together to become neighbors. And boy, do I have a very special neighbor for you to meet. You probably already know, some of you probably already know him because um, he is a famous athlete. And I'm so excited that he agreed to be on our show. And we're going to share a little bit of how we came about becoming friends. But he is a hockey player for the NHL. He started his career in at the Red Wings, which we all know and love, and then the New York Rangers, Boston Bruins, and then the Philadelphia Flyers, and Washington Capital, Capital, Capitals. So I want to welcome Mike Knubel. Uh, on my show, I'm so excited. Yeah. Oh, it's good to be here. Good <laughs> How was here. that? I was. I hope I got all that right. Yeah, there's a lot of information <laughs> there. So, but yeah, no, uh, it's it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, so well, let's just tap right into it as we do here at in Grand Tap Media. Talk about um, what it's been like right off the bat a little bit about what it's been like to be um, an athlete that has reached your level and how you came about that. And did you know at a young age? So you're going to share a little bit about you right sure. now. Yeah, well, I think I think if you took a general poll of any 10 to 12 year old about what they want to do in life, you know, I think if you ask any young boy, you know, if they play sports at all, they want to be a pro and whatever they're going to be. And and um, but that was certainly my goal at that age. Um, the unique thing I grew up in Grand Rapids, and the unique thing unique right. thing about Grand Rapids was that why it was a little bit misleading for kids is like you never saw anybody. You didn't have a frame of reference. There wasn't anybody from Grand Rapids who had gone off and played for the Red Wings or played in the NFL really? or Even played. Even though it was yeah. in Detroit. Yeah, no, it was. It was. It was a very far. Like there was none. Of, there was for a lot of years. For a lot of years, there was no like person to look up to from our area. There might have been the odd ball player that that came out. Maybe I can think like Jim Cott. Maybe was Zealand or something like that. And there might have been somebody in college who might have made it to Central Michigan or played at Michigan, but nobody who was on TV out there. Um, uh, playing all the time for you to follow. Um, so how did you even know? That so no, it, yeah, yeah. But so so as, as a kid, you know, you're kind of like, well, you know, I want to be a pro. Well, that doesn't happen at kids from Grand Rapids. You know, kids from Grand Rapids can't achieve that stuff. And so, um, you know, that was that was kind of like sort of like not not an idea, but an underlying underlying thing you picked up. Like ah, oh, that's for other kids. That's from kids from big cities or Chicago or Detroit or wherever. It doesn't happen to kids in West Michigan. So. Like I said, every 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 12, 13 year old kid has a pipe dream. They're going to turn pro. Um, I had the same dream uh, back then. I uh, didn't know how I was going to go about it, and all I did, all I knew was to be able to just play hockey as a kid, and I did that and got through my high school years and. Did your dad? Junior, yeah. Did your dad real quickly? Did your dad introduce you to that? Because in this area, football and, yeah. and basketball and things were really, but hockey. It's kind of been a private. You had to pay for. Um, yeah, to certainly, do that. certainly, it wasn't like uh, yeah, the football, the basketballs, the baseballs of of uh, as far as where fathers take their boys. Well, so I'll be backing up a little bit. When my my parents were married in Grand Rapids and then transferred to Toronto for ten years and and uh, probably up there, I don't know, late sixties to mid seventies. You know, by the time they moved back to to Grand Rapids, so. What do, what do fathers do with their kids there on Saturday afternoons? You don't go out and throw a football round or a baseball. You go to the rink. Oh, okay. You take them to the yeah. rink. So my brother and I were, I have a brother who's a year younger, so we were probably ages three and four, you know. Uh, and so in order to give my mom a little peace and quiet and get the animals out of the house, <laughs> you know, like you take us skating for the afternoon. And right, right. It's kind of what, what men did with their boys, what fathers did with their boys back then in, in Toronto versus kind of going to the gym here or going out to the field or, or whatever. You went, you took your boys to the ice. So that was, that was our introduction. So when you were starting to get into the hockey mm -hmm. and you saw, saw that, when did you start to, to think that you, you know what I mean, that you were really good at it? Did you, at an early age, you started to see that you were very skillful? And, be, and being a hockey player, well, how did that all, because yeah. you know what I mean, there's natural mm -hmm. talent, sure. and then you have to build on it. Was yeah. it something that your dad kind of instilled in you, or did you kind of start, other people start noticing? Yeah, no, I think, I think um, back then, like, it kind of came easy to me, 
you know, relatively speaking, for, you know, with, with some of the teams I'm on. And we, we, you know, I wouldn't play just, lo I mean, we play a lot in Detroit and Chicago and um, um, play against teams, you know, a lot, a lot, you know, kids who are pretty good at it from bigger cities, you know. So you kind of saw it in that respect. Now, I wasn't quite playing the highest level I could play for my age bracket, but uh, a, a level of probably a step down, you know. So if I, maybe if I would have moved up to that, that higher level, then it would have been a little bit, slower process or not as not as much uh, success you know so but the good thing was we had a nice cluster of kids from Grand Rapids um, you know different school districts and that and we had a nice little group and we'd bounce around you know we play in Detroit Detroit based league and bounce to Chicago and stuff so uh, but overall you know like I had a passion for it I enjoyed it I, I kind of got some of the, in, the ins and outs a little bit more, and I and and it just. Uh, did it you go to a lot of? Um, did you have like extra coaching? Did you did you go to um, you know several more camps? You know how it is today. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think I don't know if it's even as as is as bad as it was maybe five or ten years ago when my kids were, kind mm -hmm. of that. But the whole the the whole thing of getting extra training, extra coach, because they saw it as a way of getting into a university. Sure. Because of the cost. Yeah. And playing an athlete, that was really good if you could get some kind of scholarship. Well, right? that's, that's a whole other conversation we can have. But <laughs> um, back at that time, I mean, back at that time, no, you, you played hockey from mid-September to the end of February, you know. Okay. And then you went off, and then you played baseball, and then you played golf, and then you played tennis, you know. And it was just all kinds of other things. Um, Did you do other sports? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, 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 there was no specializing. There was no such thing. There weren't specific coaches there weren't like i say it was grand rapids like there weren't the resources weren't here yet the city wasn't where it is now right you know people haven't been drawn to the city like they do now right. i mean we were a little town you know i mean grand exactly. rapids is not exactly a metropolis by any means you know it's uh -huh. uh, you know as, especially 25 30 years ago and so um no you just kind of you know you put your skates away but that's kind of what everybody was doing it didn't really matter there wasn't there wasn't a ton of kids there weren't a ton of kids from even other towns like doing extra training yet, you know. Um, they play a lot during the winter. They play a little bit more during the winter and try and find some, you know, really good competition. But there was not that specializing yet. And it, it's still, I believe, for young kids, maybe you've got to play uh, all the sports. You can't, you, there's no need to specialize. You need to play, you know, if it's football in the fall, then basketball, baseball, you know, lacrosse, You still golf. believe that today? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now an athlete will get to a point where they've got to concentrate more uh, on what they're doing. And then you've got to make gains in your weight room and your conditioning and put on strength and all that where you can't be in competition playing some sports because it takes too much out of you to do the proper training right, and stuff right, like right. that. Okay. So there is a time when you hit, but it's not, shouldn't be till 6 to 15, 16 in there, you know. And when did you, okay, so now let's just tap in, okay. So you, during your high school year, when did you start, at what age did you start to see that you possibly could even play at the college level? Because you got to understand, you, you see this all the time. you got these um, athletes that are in school and they're doing mm -hmm. rather well, um, and maybe they're being told they're doing really better than what, I think that was when you go to Division One in mm -hmm. college, and mm -hmm. I'll tell you, my son went off to um, the college level, and it was it was a rude awakening. Mm -hmm. uh, the talent was out throughout the United, United States. But anyways, with you, I mean, what, did you, what age did you start seeing, you know what, I am on a, I, I, I can possibly make it. I mean, because to let everybody know, you went to U of M. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. wasn't even, that's not yeah, an easy yeah. college to get into. But yeah. how are they recognizing you, and when did you start to notice? Well, probably age like 16, 17. I actually played two years at East Kentwood there. And after my first year, I had a really good year. And then uh, yeah, going into my senior year, I, I had an option to move away and go play in Kalamazoo. There was a junior team there. Uh, and I could have gone to, you know, I would have just gone to school down there and finished up and then uh um, you know kind of we decided to defer a year okay and wait a year because the kids hadn't really done that again that's something now is quite normal in the hockey world and back then it was kind of like kids in west michigan didn't do that you know it wasn't right. really of an opportunity who did that you know so that i deferred a year so probably that 16 17 age i started like putting up very good high school numbers and then you know you're a big fish in a small pond you know and so now you got to go to the bigger pond which was junior hockey and did pretty well there too and then uh you know things happen quick and i ended up committing to michigan during i was i'd finished high school i was so i actually I, you know i went i f finished high school as a 17 year old turned 18 played mm -hmm. uh, junior hockey and and then uh, enrolled at Michigan as a 19-year-old. So um, they recruited you yeah, to come oh, yeah, and play yeah, for yeah, them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So was there other schools too? That yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a number. I had I visited three or four other schools, but uh, uh, you know, and obviously, uh, uh, 
our team was based in Kalamazoo, so Western was right there. The Western Michigan's coach, coach's son played for our team, you know, so he saw our team all the time. So right. I was kind of close to going Western, and then Michigan jumped in, and I went that way very Wait, quickly. Did, yeah. did you always want to go to Michigan? Were you I didn't. Fan? No, I didn't. It's hard to say. I mean, I, I didn't. I, I, you know, it's, Michigan State didn't recruit me. I might have gone there if they would have recruited me. But they didn't. Okay. They recruited another. Because well, I'm a big fan of Michigan. Yeah, State. no, no, I, you know? I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and that was, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, I really. They were never in the picture for me. So. Okay. Um, but you know, I, I always said you don't have to sell Michigan to a Michigan kid. You know. So, no, no, either yeah. one is pretty good. Yeah. I mean, you got a full ride. Yeah, well, yeah, to, yeah. yeah. That must have felt good. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you do yeah. a full ride, is it? If you have to, is it a? I, because my son didn't get out full ride, but I'm just saying that you do you have to perform or do you have to be at the level of you know to keep that going year after year? Yeah, I mean, I, you probably have to perform on on the ice and you have to have, be good in the classroom. Now, lots of full ride right? guys aren't going to be. You're not going to be in all. Some aren't going to be all American. Some aren't going to be your leading scorer. I mean, there's 18 scholarships. You're not going to hit on everybody, you know. So, right, right. Um, but yeah, no, I was fortunate enough to go there on full scholarship all four years. I was there, you know, and so um, I took a lot of pride in that. Been? That was good, you know. Yes. I took a lot of pride in that, you know. So, um, <laughs> you know, that's always good. That's always a good thing, and so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I would be too. I'd be. I'd be very honored to go um, to U of N or Michigan State or. Um, those big college, you know, you know how the state works. I mean, people like to be one or for the other, right? Yeah, you yeah, people yeah. Like, oh, I don't really care, and I'm like, oh, yeah. we're not talking to you. But yeah. you know, I like, yeah. I like to always root for um, Michigan. When no one Michigan State's out, I will root for if U of M still in. Oh, okay. I'll root for you, right. you know? well, <laughs> not like a lot well, of people. Your brother yeah, is a yeah. state fan, right? Oh uh, yeah, he went there. Yeah, yeah, he did his post grad at Michigan, but uh, okay. he went to his undergrad there. Yeah. And, uh, what did you major in? Um, at, I was phys ed. I ended up as physical education. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, have you been able to use that? No, no. A lot of coaching now. You know, I mean, I guess, I, I guess you coach not in, not in a school environment, but you know, I, I do work per, part time with the pro team here in town. Yeah, uh, sure. So using that, and I coach kids too. I coach. I've coached my older boy uh, Cam, an eighteen year old now. I coached him when he was younger and his team, and I have a fourteen year old son uh, who's coming up and through. So I'm a current coach of their team uh, at at Fox Motors Hockey Club. And uh, and so I do use some of it, you know. I guess right. I do use some of it. I am using it probably every day. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. All right, let's talk about some of your career. You you had a a nice career in the the, the pro hockey. You had what 16, 17 years. Seventeen years pro, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. An, and if, and you started off. Now let's talk about that. I was I was doing some research with you. You know, my husband knew who you were, and we met. We'll talk about how we met and how we uh, became. Um, you know, why you are here today. But when you started, when you had your debut, now first of all, you were you could have went to hockey pro hockey earlier, right? Did did you have some kind of where you could before Michigan, Michigan were people looking at you before U of M? Yeah. So uh, after that year, when I was eighteen, playing, I was eligible for the NHL draft, and then I was drafted by Detroit. Right. Yeah, I yeah. saw. So I read said, that. said, just go off to school and you don't worry about it. Well, you know, oh, they so, they just oh, hold your rights when oh, you go to school. I see what you're yeah, saying. yeah. And they okay. said when. We'll decide. We'll all decide together when it's time for you to turn pro. You know, and so um, I had a chance. I could have signed with them after my junior year of college, and again, I chose to wait. Uh, we had a very good team in Ann Arbor. I enjoyed Ann Arbor. There was actually a lockout going on, and it was either play in Glens Falls, New York, or play hockey in Ann Arbor. And I was like, I'm staying in Ann Arbor with my buddies. You know, and so right, right. Um, yeah, so that was it's kind of a no-brainer. So anyway, I returned for a senior year, and then as soon as my senior year at Michigan finished. It's like first week of April, we lost in the national semifinal. Then I turned pro and went off to Glens Falls, and then spent the whole next year there, and then another another half a year, about this time of year, early you know uh, mid March or so, uh, I was called up to Detroit in my second year pro, and so uh, yeah. And we, okay, let's talk yeah. about that when yeah. you were called when your debut at Detroit. I was reading on this too, yeah. and I actually actually went to YouTube and saw um, this. So your debut. For the NHL was on March 26, 1997. The debut came against the Colorado Avalanche in the in the famous um, fight night at Joe. Can you wait? Fight night at the Joe match. <laughs> I'll share that because I looked it up yeah. on the internet. I'm like, yeah. what the heck? I yeah. mean, what did, what were you thinking? When you <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, anybody. Watching this, who's uh, knows you anything about hockey you, you in Michigan? Yeah, yeah, any, yeah, yeah. And even hockey fans around the world. Even when I played on other teams, and they, you know, you talk about your first game there. 
you bring that up that that's a game they're like oh i know that game mm -hmm. i remember that game so it's certainly certainly memorable and it was you know if you go back there was an unbelievable rivalry between detroit and colorado mm -hmm. and uh that game you know was was my first game and uh the score had gone four to one or four to two and it was kind of an incident between two players on the ice, Igor Larionov and Peter Forsberg, and then Darren McCarty uh, went after Claude Lemieux, who had hit, hit Chris Draper a couple years previous, about a year and a half before, and broke his jaw and stuff like that. So there was a big like score getting settled. Then the goalies were fighting. Everybody was just chaos right on the ice. And, and so that was my first game, and so I kind of got swept up into that rivalry. And, um, yeah. You know, it's certainly exciting. Now, the, the minor leagues that I went to, that I played in the American League, which is where the Grand Rapids Griffins play now, uh -huh. but now it's a lot more cleaned up. Like it was much more like the American League, like that, looked like a minor league game versus a major league game, you know, at that time. So well, you okay? The one thing about hockey, we, we out of all the sports that I have watched and attended, is that we kind of want that experience of the fighting don't yeah. you do you feel that that's been part of the hockey that's like almost like ooh, you know what i mean yeah it's kind of what what your what your fans want to see some is that like do you guys know that or is it really that you just get mad at each other i mean where's well for a long time it was there were players that was their role that was their job and it was a job in the nhl to be a very good fighter um the, game, the teams had a, a spot on their roster for a player like that who liked to, who was good at fighting. And oftentimes <laughs> it, was, it was two or three guys. And they didn't have to be the best player, okay. but they had to provide that element of intimidation um, and that they were like the poli a policeman, you know? Like if something bad happened to one of their players and somebody took advantage of one of their players or was, okay. uh, was, act, was acting up, here. had to straighten <laughs> people out. And every team had... More, more, most of them back in the day, they might have had two or three types of these guys, you know, and they had to play a little bit. They didn't have to be fantastic. Coach knew what they, everybody knew what their job was. Okay. And they had a good feel for, they're actually very smart guys. They're not like meatheads because they have to make reads on stuff and they have to understand some dynamics of the game and uh, keeping track of scores to settle a little bit and when to do things, when to act up, when not to act up. Maybe I, maybe I just go talk to somebody. Maybe I have, maybe now it's time to punch a guy. Maybe it's time to have a fight. Maybe it's time to settle things down here and go lay a big body check instead of fighting. Like they, they have, they were very, actually very sharp guys who, who I read the game, the game within the game. You know, there's always like an undercurrent in the game, an understory, and they would kind of pick up on that. And they knew kind of when to, when to uh, bare their teeth uh -huh. in case or throw fists or uh and when to really just kind of maybe they could talk to a guy maybe they could just be in the area maybe they can circle around and just give a guy a look you know and i know how and they so yeah they can kind of do that too like, yeah, yeah yeah and so uh there's a lot of uh you know hockey's a very interesting sport because a lot of times you know the whistle ends the play but the play will kind of continue you know there's kind of there's jockeying around after there's talking there's intimidation going on there's um uh, talking about what I'm going to do to you later, you know, stuff like that. There's right, all kinds right. of setting the table. You're setting the table for things. And, and there's a little bit of, there's obviously gamesmanship in there, You're trying to see if I can't scare this guy a little bit. Maybe I can intimidate this guy. Maybe I can get him thinking about me instead of playing playing great so that was very much a skill like uh back in the day to Does be that hurt? so i mean is you guys really out to hurt each other um you yeah yeah other? yeah i think so i think so because you know those guys like uh when you were in that role as a fighter that you would you know you don't want to lose too many of your fights because it's sort of like then you're not very good at your job you know so um but i i do think a lot of the guys they have they had a, a ton of respect for each other and it's funny to see that people fighting but a lot of them you know, some fought mad. I mean, I guess they fought mad sometimes, but a lot of times they don't fight mad. They're doing their job. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. just exerting their influence. Right. Uh, and so, but that that you know, and that but the that, fans get involved. Yes, with that, yes. So the fans like, like that, that, yes, yes. But it is very. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, guys are cut. Guys get concussions. Guys get teeth knocked out. Like it's very real, and it, hands are broken. And I know and all that. It's not. There's nothing fake about it. No. Now, now when I was watching the the, it's a 50 minute video that yeah. if you want to watch it on YouTube on the fight night um, at the Joe, but what happens if you hit the refs? See, yeah, I'm yeah, how yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. I go, is it all well, knowing that it can't, there's some kind of under underlying rule you don't do that? Yeah, no, you can't. Because, well, now, yeah, it could be a suspension, too, if they determine that's a little bit on purpose. But the ref, refs are, and if you watch a, a, a hockey fight with refs, they, they're they not getting in the middle of that. Like, until, well, until, that, that, they until guys get tired, <laughs> then 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 they might yeah. get involved and guys get tired out a little bit. But, they're you know, they know the deal. And like you say, they weren't going to stop guys, like, a little more in the day. 
Now they're worried. Now they'll get involved a little bit more for player safety. But back in the day, it was like that was their job. The refs would let their guys do their job. Okay. Right. Let them do their role. Like they're a fighter, let them fight. Okay. That's their job. Right. They need that. Need to have that fight so they they can have their job. So there's a fine line there with refs. Right. They, the refs don't want anybody to get hurt, but at the same time they can't let this go on too long. So they've got to get in the middle of it and make sure nobody gets sucker punch at the end. That guys get away scot free. Right, with no major damage, right? Guys will get a black eye or something like that, but nobody's really getting hurt. They can return, they can go to the penalty box and they're healthy to return to play. And I think that's what what everybody, even the tough guys, I think they're like, Yeah, we'll have our fight. I don't wanna hurt you, I don't wanna get hurt. But like, are they, like, are they yeah. nice when they're out the door? Oh, really? they're, they're first guys to have a beer with you. Yeah. Oh, they're first guys. Like as soon as they, like again, it's their job. I mean, it's not not out animals on the street like beating people uh, up on the street. It's their job, and they'd be the first guy in the bar after the game to buy the guy they just fought a beer. Oh, oh you know, and, right. and then talk about their fight and re, you know not not reenact it, but they go through it. Here's what I was thought you were gonna do, and you did this, and I was like, oh, you know, you caught me with a good one, and have a few laughs, have a beer or two, and. Yeah. go on their way you did know? you ever start did you was that did you start playing? i you know i think i think through the course of your years you have a few i probably had a half a dozen to not many more than that but right, you know right. they just kind of happen and <laughs> i i don't I, you know i i think you know in the league and these days they don't like the stage fights where guys are like fighting right at the whistle they don't mind like if guys are battling in the corner battling in the corner and then a fight springs out of that i think everybody's pretty Pretty even even people that don't like fighting probably don't mind that as much than the guys like making it into almost like a a show you know right right and they try to eliminate that they've enforced penalties and fines for that let's let's not put on the show all the time like we don't mind if they're fighting and it's spontaneous uh -huh. that's fine but let's not turn to a show and right and you know that the focus you know again the league's got always got to toe that line right and uh, where the focus is on the skill and the speed and the beauty of the game but. You know, you still kind of people like the fights too. You know, so how do we how do we kind of let the fights go, but without turning it into the WWE yeah. with theatrics and exactly. Exactly. guys making a mockery out of everything, and then you lose the beauty of the game, and you turn the game into something that you don't want it. You, if the game starts heading in a direction you don't want it to go. That's true. So be that. So that was your debut. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, and you yeah. got to enjoy some uh, some gr yeah. um, you know some great accomplishments with the D Detroit Red Wings. Yeah. With the Stanley Cup, what was that like to be to win yeah. that? Yeah, well, finishing up on that game there, I think uh, you know that all that stuff blew up, and uh, I think it was the Red, the Red Wings were down four to two, I believe, and then um, had all this big incident. And once they cleaned it up and got back to the end, it was probably over half the game left, and then okay. like, roughly half the game, and then cleaned up that mess, and then um, Red Wings won six to five in overtime with about there was about oh ten games left in the season, so it was a big like push to the fi push to the playoffs and. Um, really like propelled the team <laughs> yeah no like really propelled the team like it was really like oh brought yeah in. yeah like brought the team together brought the town together brought Detroit the city the city was on fire like the city's like these are great you know this is a we got a special team here look what look what just happened and look look uh, look how they did in the game and the fights They're like we got we got something special here so for those couple years and then so yeah I didn't go back to the minors after after uh, the regular season they kept me around and they won the Stanley Cup in 97 and again had to go through Colorado Right. To go through them in the playoffs, <laughs> and which was, uh, I mean, it was a fantastic rivalry. I mean, they were I, two fantastic hockey teams. I mean, if you look at both rosters these days, there's probably 15 Hall of Famers combined on those two rosters. I mean, it's... Oh, wow. I mean, okay. it, the hockey was, it was, it was Did, really tough hockey. Like, guys beat the tar out of each other, and then guys made unbelievable hockey skill plays, too. Like, it was... It was a special time in hockey. I think it was a very special rivalry. Well, it sounds like it would have been yeah. really exciting. Your name yeah. is on the uh, on the cup, you know, yeah. on, the, on the first, yeah. on the second one. Second correct? one, yeah, yeah. Yes. So I got there too late to get my name on the first one. I made the team outright the next year, and they won again. And I know they that's got to be Washington in the finals. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. that's not. I mean, well, some of them they they do do that, but that is very. Um, What's that? Is it common for go back to back on champions? No, I don't think it's not very common. I th well, I think. I think Pittsburgh has done it like I don't know. You have to correct me, but it's it's not incredibly common. Um, uh, might have been a little bit more common back then without getting too like businessy about hockey because now there's a salary cap. Back then there right. wasn't a salary cap, and you could keep. It was easier as long as you had the checkbook like Mr. Illich had. He, he could just keep his group together. You know, I mean, as long as they weren't getting too old as a group, you could keep your group together. Now these days, you know, it's you only have so much money to spend, so you've got to make you got to let guys go. Now Detroit could never had the teams they had in 97, 98. 
with the five Russians and Steve Eisenman and Brendan right. Shanahan and the Mike Vernon and the goal and you know the names. The and names. what was that like? Okay, let's talk about that. I mean, I know that um, you know they, they were bringing in a lot of foreign or, or do they always do that? Well, I mean, with the with the Iron Curtain, the, everything had changed in the nineties. Yeah. On that, do they were bringing in more and more of, of yeah, uh, yeah kind of well the world players? opened up, you know, and, right? The and world opened up with the down yeah, with the Iron Curtain. Yeah, the, the wall sort of and fell the wall there, fell. and now players. Uh, there might have, there was a few that came out before, like maybe probably I think Slava Fatisov came over before, but they had to do effect, and they were taking literally their lives in their own hands, exactly, like to get and their families' lives, and people they left behind were mm -hmm. paid. Some probably paid a pretty good price to because so and so left, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so certainly when that when that wall started coming down, it really started to open up free trade amongst players, you know, and players could move back and, f and players could come over quite easier. And, but there's Instead a language being, dam yeah, there's uh, a language barrier yeah, and everything. So how yeah. did that go when work, you know, when you're playing with, do they know English? Do they know um, they Some do. I mean, some qu pick it up quicker than others, you know. Um, some, you know, if you're, if you're coming from, if you're a player and you grew up in Moscow, you might pick up a little bit more. If you're from way out in Siberia, you don't know a lick of English, you know, and hardly have a way that anybody even found you to get you over to play in the NHL, you know? Uh, so there is a learning curve in that respect for sure. Did you get did you get along well on the team? I mean, did you guys, you know, was there, or was yeah. it real competitive? I know comp there's, I don't know where the fine line is. I mean, yeah. Maybe you can show You need to have that little bit of competitive edge, but yet how do you build the team? Yeah, yeah. With well, that competitive edge? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With yeah, yeah. Oh, no, there's it. so, I mean, it's pro sports, there's competition, even amongst your own team, there's mm -hmm. incredible competition, but, um, I don't know, you know, you, you actually had a leader of the <coughs> Russian guys who was Slava Fetisov, and he was like the most senior guy, right? So he was the most senior one. He was one of the first Russians to come over. So the younger guys, the, the Fedorovs, the Konstantinovs, the Kozlovs, Larry Adolf was probably closer in age to uh, um, uh, Fetisov that they all, you know, they, they slid right under him. Like a hierarchy, right? So they mm -hmm. just said if, if you know, he kind of was the big bear. They called him Papa Bear. That was his nickname. Like really? He took care, and those were all his cubs, <laughs> you know. And so, you know, whatever he kind of sa said, whatever he thought, whatever he said, went with all the, with the other ones, you know. So, as long as he was there to guiding it, and he understood, he wanted to be there, and they all kind of picked up on him, you know. And so, uh, but they were they were good guys. Like they, they, you know, at the end of the day, I think as as a pro, you could really care less as long as the guy, when it's time to play, that the guy's going to play his, his rear end off for you. And so, well, that's true. Yeah, you know, and they were fab I mean, they were they were players. They were great players, but um, you know, they could nobody could, nobody could really care if they spoke English or not, as long as they. We're playing as long so as so that they, wasn't they a barrier. You no, just knew no, how no. to when you're out there. No, it's really no. And so one of them, you know, like the Slava knew English better. He didn't even know English great, but they would kind of translate and work okay. themselves through it to get their message out and to get messages to to them all. They kind of, you know, you know, they're sure they had little huddles <coughs> to kind of talk about things and right. what, what's he trying to say and whisper. You know, hey, like during a meeting, you translate, you know, to somebody who didn't know English as well. You know, so. Um, so yeah, how did then the longer feel? they're here, they pick it up, you know. All right. So how did you, I mean, I'm sure that wasn't, were you disappointed when Detroit traded you or you were traded? Yeah. Yeah, no, I've...